It's quite strange for writers because our experience is before the experience of everybody else on the show starts. So I suppose for me, it's just being in the writer's room with all the other writers and just coming up with ideas and laughing and eating lots of sweets. It's just... It's just really fun, and we look at pictures of the actors and stuff that we have pinned up on the wall and think, well, what are we going to do with them today? I think it's really mood-based, because um, we all write for all the different characters. Um, but it's just sometimes you're in a, a foul, vengeful, Dr Statham kind of mood, so you'll write something, you know, really quite unpleasant and worrying. And sometimes you're in a slightly more sort of swishy, romantic, Mac and Caroline kind of mood, so you can write a nice little sort of... Hope for a nice bit of dialogue between them and, and just a nice scene involving them. I suppose ideas come from everywhere, from situations that you find yourself in, that friends find themselves in. So we'll have big writers' meetings where we all sit around and go, well, this has happened to me and this has happened to my friend and it would make a good storyline, so that's how it happens. I had tried to use things that happened in real life because I have very briefly worked in a hospital um, in an operating... Not like a surgeon, that would be appalling but I was wheeling people in and out of the operating room and various things did happen which I tried to put in green wing I someone um, in the recovery room when they they have a tube up your nose there's loads of blood vessels so it's very bad and this guy was obviously unconscious and they took the tube out of his nose and they just and he just sneezed while he was unconscious and I was just standing there and it's just blood just just absolutely covered in blood and I was just standing there you know, slightly shell-shocked anyway and the nurse looked over him and he had a purple wristband and they were saying you know, saying, what's purple is that hepatitis or is that HIV which, which one is it? I was just standing there, already, like, clotting. I never did find out, but I, that was a long time ago, and I'm all right, so presumably that's all fine. I didn't do any research because I'm lazy. I got up and I barely learned my lines and I ate as many fry-ups as I could and tried to do as little acting as possible for my money. No, we did. We, I did do research. We went to a hospital for like three days and watched people do operations and stuff. It was great. Watching people's stomachs get cut out and people at open heart surgery. If when I go under the knife, I don't want an actor in the room, particularly not a comedy actor, going, oh... That's your inside. There you go. Oh dear, that's a nasty cancer you've got growing in there. You know, it's just not... I just don't want that to happen. This poor woman probably had no idea that we were just watching half her insides be cut out. Like, oh, the, this Irish guy, I'm not going to do the accent, this Irish doc surgeon was like, yeah, we just cut out here and we, to move the stomach out. And he just pulled her stomach out of her, like, abdomen and just pulled it out and like, let it hang out. And then he went, oh, this is the bad bit. Wrapped a bit of cheese wire around it and gave it a tug and a bit of it like popped off it was just like you have never you just don't want to you know there's certain situations where i just don't want a load of fucking comedians in my room when i'm getting like my prostate removed or whatever they found it from but it, it smelt it smelt of old dogs and we all were, always were itching as soon as we came out of it was sure it had a, some rather rabid old dog in it at some stage so 
and action. Ah, the smell of the sea. It's, it's not the sea. I'm sure we're going to get fleas from this place. <laughs> could I, could I hold your breasts while we dance? Thank you. Very good. Oh, no, mind the head. So we were holed up in there for quite some time, and bits of the steering wheel kept coming off, or the gear sticks. It didn't fill you with much faith as you were driving around in it. Anything with the camper van, somehow I ended up in it, usually, lying on the floor in the back, shouting instructions at, at Mark or Pippa, or whoever happened to be in there. And knowing the amount of filth that was in there, everyone would trudge in and out with their filthy, muddy, slightly dog-shitty boots. Uh, and, and then, you know, ten minutes after they'd done that, and you could see the floor was crawling in filth and slime, I'd have to climb in there and lie down on that floor and keep really low and close to it to keep out of shot. So if they're shooting through the windscreen, they wouldn't see my head stick up. I felt like I was on a surreal holiday a lot of the time because I'd be stuck in it. We'd drive off down the road. There'd be no, you know, miles away from the camera because we'd have to you know, go off down the road, turn around and come back or drive down a country lane or something like that. And Mark would be driving kind of half, half in character and half just Mark. And he's a very good driver, actually, but he, as a result, he's quite sort of confident at swerving and bumping over things and I could never see what was going on. The amount of trouble we had with that van anyway, it, it was just such a joy to see it explode um, and know that I never had to lie in the back. It made me want to be a man who blows things up for a living. I, I can't imagine anything more fun than going to work with big sacks full of petrol and strapping them to a car and then leading some wires to a relatively safe distance that doesn't look that safe and then pressing buttons and things go kaboom. I mean, you obviously there's only one take where you can blow up this massive great thing that is so important to the whole of the last episode and uh, so we were sitting with our backs to the explosion and we decided we were definitely not going to make a, a movement or a gesture because that was the way we were going to sort of play it so we did the scene 140 different ways you know to get everything they want covered and then you know we came to the tape where we we're actually going to take it and you know, we said the last line knowing that the next thing was going to the explosion and we sat there and then there was just this Almighty, almighty bang. Such heat. It was the most freezing cold day, but suddenly we were just absolutely baking. I'm sure that I was going to be singed on my back. It was just like daring each other to how long could we pretend that nothing had happened when we both thought we were actually on fire. And then we just slowly looked round and... Uh, saw the uh, inferno behind us. Quiet! And action! I've never blown anything up before. I don't like camper vans. It was great. <laughs>
we went flying. That was very good fun. 925, take three AMB cameras. Close your eyes and uh, hang on a sec. Isn't it funny how things turn out? Hang on, don't move, don't move! one of my lines, I remember. In one of the previous I, takes, I said, I? I can see your car. And then and we got I, up there and you said the same thing. That is, in, in, in many ways, Gotta one of the hallmarks back. of our partnership. Gotta watch your back. Uh, 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 I wonder if anyone can see up my kilt. I hope you haven't laddered my tights. OK. I'm not wearing any pants. I think they that's probably enough now. It started off being quite a fun day on the beach, beautiful beach down Camber Sands, and it was absolutely beautiful, but it wasn't warm really. It was quite a sunny day, but it wasn't warm, and it wasn't warm in the water at all. And so there was a certain heightened level of stress about that anyway, because these, there were people in the water wearing very little and getting very cold. We had uh, two actors in the water, and then a camera just on the shore, very close to the waterline, that was shooting them with a very long lens. And then we had a boat in the water near the actors, and then there was the monitors slightly further back up the beach, away from the camera. Everybody needs to be able to talk to everybody else. And somehow I ended up being the kind of communication hub of the whole operation. And action! Trying to pass on so many different messages. And everyone obviously was talking all at once. So I had messages coming to me from the boat, you know, from the actors via the boat on one on run radio. And then I had messages coming to me from the monitor behind me to pass on to the actors or to the cameraman or to both. And if I started getting it all wrong and shouting the wrong things to the wrong people at the wrong time, I'd either make them film things that were rubbish that when no one was acting because they didn't know to start acting, or I'd shout something at the people when they were acting and it was in the middle of a shot without realising that that was going on, or try and tell the boat to move out of the shot a little bit. And the water was getting shallower all the time as well, so the illusion of people being far, far, far out at sea was rapidly going to be lost. It was horrific. I became a kind of parody of assistant directing with all these stupid megaphones and radios everywhere. I remember several people laughing at me, and I think someone filmed me doing it, which I'm really pleased about. <laughs> Jasper, could the boy go slightly further out to sea, please? 